We're having a Friday night tour study! Good evening and welcome to our Friday night tour study and Shabbat Shalom, right? Yeah, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. He, he, thank you, Miss Janet. Paul, you're fired. Okay. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We welcome you to our Friday night tour study. We do this every Friday night with the exception of free feast at 7.30 p.m. We get together at 6 o'clock and do some Arab Shabbat liturgy a little bit, and we do some fellowship, and we start Shabbat together. And then late tomorrow night after sundown, we'll end Shabbat together. So we're so excited to be here together. We're so excited to have you here with us. So if this is your first time visiting us, please like and subscribe to our channel and connect with us on all so social media platforms. That way you can stay informed of any upcoming changes or notifications, especially when the feasts come. And it's right around the corner. Pesach is almost here. So just to give you a little bit about how we do services. So we'll start our evening with prayer and praises. So if you have a prayer praise here locally, you can line up. If you're online, we have our Shamash team in the room. They'll be taking all of your requests. We only ask that you would keep it to the most brief prayers and praises uh, and, and limit the backstory, if you would, please. That includes the people online. They tend, because they're online, to, to write a whole lot. So just make it as brief as possible if you're online right again. So we'll start with prayer and praise. After that, uh, Rebbiton and, Julie and her amazing team will come up and present tonight's tour portion, which is Peck You Day which is Shemot 3821 through 4038, and it means inventory of the items. So we're so excited uh, for Reverend and her team to do that today. And we have Miss Vera Linton here in the room, the artiste of uh, Parsha Pearl. So we're so happy to have her and her husband here to stay. Excited about that. And their son, Harrison. Look, I'm telling all the business. All right. We're just so excited because they're finally here. All right, so we'll do that, and after that, uh, Brianna will come up and do the announcements, so that's exciting, after the tour portion, and then Rabbi will come out and do the Midrash and Q&A and answer any questions or comments you may have. We asked every time we go through the tour portion, even when Rebbiton and her team are presenting, that you look for what you can apply to your life now, today. You might be thinking, well, what possibly could I apply to my life looking at what's going on in the temple and the, the explanations of all the things. Well, guess what? You should be taking inventory of your life every day. As soon as Abba gives you the ability to open your eyes or he opens your eyes in the morning, you should be taking an inventory of your life. You probably should do it before you go to bed. But if you should open your eyes, you should be starting with a thank you. Abba, I thank you for on and on and on and on. You can stay there all day. Uh, King David said, if I had 10,000 tongues. He couldn't think of enough things to be grateful and, and to praise our before. So we know that, and we're excited. So tonight, we're going to start here locally with our prayer and praise with Miss Amy. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I just want to praise the Father because I got my business. It started. Amen. I, I passed certification for, into, uh, for TurboTax into it. Amen. And keep me in prayer because the 21st, there's another job uh, business I want to apply for because I can do that year round and, <laughs> uh, and uh, it would better suit me and I won't have to look for other businesses. Awesome. Thank the Father. Amen. Amen. Great job. Yeah. Clap for that. It's awesome. She's been working hard at that. Shabbat shalom, Miss Janet. Shabbat shalom, Elder Billy. How are you? Good, good, good. <laughs> shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. It's a good day, Shabbat. Um, and my husband will be here in, on Sunday, which is amazing and Amen. good and great. And Amen. I just want to ask for prayer for travel. Versus he's, he's a superhero. I mean, he's driving 13 hours to come wow. and see us. That's why he didn't text me. Every Shabbat <laughs> texted me and say, Shabbat shalom, Elder. And I didn't get it tonight. Now I know why. Shabbat shalom, <laughs> Olivier. Can't wait to see you. Be safe. Don't stop to text me either while you're driving. Okay, go ahead. No, I seriously, <laughs> seriously praise you for, for him. Amen. Because I've been, I've been humbling myself to submit to my husband. Amen. Uh, and things are working out better and better and better, which Amen. is really good. Amen. And <clears throat> I appreciate you also, Elder, for um, scheduling that time. <laughs> <laughs> for next week, which is uh, part of uh, what I need to do, you oh, know, good. after talking to my husband, say, hey, you have to do this and that. And so I'm just praising my father because uh, he gives ev he gives us everything that we need Amen. in this walk. Amen. There's moments where we're going to need help and support and guidance. 
covering and he provides all for that oh, for us and in, a, in a, an abundant way oh. so praise Yah for that thank oh, you amen oh, amen absolutely that's awesome 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 shabbat shalom shannon shabbat shalom elder shabbat shalom everyone um just asking for for prayers i am i'm going in a direction where um i'm not going to go into detail of what i'm doing but i'm taking courses to upskill and something that i know will get me to where i want to go and my and i can i know the red part of me just wants results and now i finally am like this is what i want i want to go for it and i made goals and i just prayers that i just i just keep to it not get discouraged but just keep going at it oh, amen thank you absolutely certainly pray for that <laughs> amen shabbat shalom michael Shabbat Shalom. So I'm coming up because uh, Ashley asked me if I give this praise for her, um, that her godson's mother just found out two days ago that she is now cancer free. Amen. Um, after rounds of chemo, uh, excuse me, after rounds of radiation, the trach and chemo. Amen. So hallelujah Amen. for that. Amen. I was so good. So good. What a praise. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, Mr. Harold. Shamish, Mr. Harold. Shabbat Shalom, Elder. <laughs> I've got a praise and a prayer request. I praise that uh, I had my uh, son from Texas, his wife, and three kids were here. The, Amen. The week. I spent a lot of time with them. Spent, awesome. And prayer for their trip back home. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is awesome. All right. Hey, Mr. Vernon's back there. Hey, Mr. Vernon. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. This is family. All right. Live stream. Okay. Shirley Akpalu, comfort and healing to my son and all who are hurting. Mm -hmm. Kathy Collette, after many tests, I found out I have multiple sclerosis. Please pray. Sharissa Phillips, Shabbat Shalom. Praise Yah for spared life. Amen. Nigel was robbed at gunpoint today. He is praising Yah for his common presence during the ordeal and for allowing him to experience another Shabbat. Amen. Didra Kosdorf praises Freddie's tooth extraction went very, very well, and he is doing great. Stayed home tonight for his recovery, and hopefully we'll be at services tomorrow. Thank you all for your prayers. Amen. Okay, we have uh, several, quite a few uh, unspoken, uh, some um, prayers and, and praises for uh, jo upcoming jobs and employment. Uh, Javi says, praiseworthy moment. My husband and I are now debt-free, excluding our house and car payments. Yahweh's abundant provision and love have made this possible through obedience. Amen. And that is it. That's all we have right now for urgent. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I also want to keep in prayer all those that have reached out this week with prayers and praises and counseling. And uh, we also pray for the leadership all around the world. It's been a busy week. And they all know why, because we get to interact and deal with Mishpaka, and it's so fun and exciting. Exciting times, that's Miss Marley. Where's Miss Marley? Anyway, I miss her. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we want to keep uh, all of those things in prayer. Excited tonight about this tour study and Rebbitz and Julie and her team presenting. Uh, Peck you day. Yeah, give them a hand. <laughs> Inventory of the items. So they'll do that right after Mr. Ollie open us up in prayer. All right, go ahead. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, thank you for this wonderful week that we've had, and now we can enter into your rest and refocus our mind. And Yahweh, I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears, that we may hear what you have for us tonight, so that we can continue on our journey and become more like you. B'shem HaMashiach. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, let's give Rebus and Julie and our team a hand as they come up and present Peck You Day.
Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> There's always one in the crowd who does things differently, right? <laughs> so, welcome everyone to tonight's Torah study of Peku Day. I'm really excited to conclude the book of Exodus. Um, so, um, these slideshows are part of YM2I. Uh, visuals that we have. And so I'm really excited, as Elder Billy said, that tonight I actually get to have the artist in the room. So <laughs> I'm a little more nervous because she's here. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, we're going to actually have some new drawings that we did not have last year. So every year I do a little more tweaking. So I'm really excited to present some drawings that will help you to visualize more of the tabernacle. And uh, tonight, as we conclude the book of Shemot, the children of Israel are going to witness and participate in an amazing event, the raising up of Yahweh's dwelling place. It is now already a year since the children of Israel said goodbye to Mitzrayim, and now all the furnishings are constructed and ready to be put in their designated places as Yahweh instructs Moshe. We will also witness the establishment of Yahweh's presence over the dwelling place, revealed in the cloud by day and fire by night, a visual object to lead and guide the children of Israel on their journeys. So we will go ahead and begin. Parsha Pekude, and as Elder Billy said, this is going to be showing the amounts or accounts of the materials that we had already looked at earlier in Exodus where Yahweh told Moshe what he wanted. Then we looked at them constructing it. Now we're going to go ahead and take an account of it to make sure that everything is there. Okay, and then after all that, it, Moshe will actually uh, oversee the raising up of the dwelling place. So exciting, here we go. <laughs> Shemot 38, 21. These were the appointments of the dwelling place. The, dw the dwelling place of the witness, which was appointed by the command of Moshe, for the service of the Levites, by the hand of Ithamar, son of Aharon, the priest. <laughs> so, on this slide, we have the gentlemen that are the leaders that work in the tabernacle. So... What I'm circling right now is Ithamar. He is Aharon's youngest son, and he is one of the supervisors for the dwelling place. Um, then, of course, we have Aharon and then Moshe. And then these are some gentlemen that you will hear more about in numbers, but we have the Gershonites here, and the Gershonites were the ones that uh, lifted the curtains of the dwelling place, the coverings, the screens, the cords, and the equipment in the courtyard. So that was their duty. And these are all from the children of Levi. Okay, then we have the Gershonites. I mean, the Kehatites, sorry. <laughs> okay, the Kehatites lifted the ark and the table, the lampstand, the altars, and the utensils. So they, did more, they were the ones who carried the things that were inside the tabernacle and then the furnishings uh, inside the courtyard. Um, but they were not able to look at them. Only the priests were allowed to, look, to carry them after they were already covered. So here this ark has a blue wrapper over it. <laughs> and then our last group of Levites are the Merorites. And the Merorites were the ones who lifted the boards, the bars, the columns, and the sockets of the dwelling place. So they all had their jobs, and they only did the job that they were told to do. And Betzalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Yehuda, made all that Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And with him, Aholiav, son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer, an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet material, and in fine linen. Okay, we had already uh, learned about these two gentlemen. They are our um, 
chief master craftsmen, and they were able to teach others. And so Beth Salel um, was um, given the spirit of Elohim. He already had the gifting, but then I, Elohim helped him with the spirit to go ahead and teach others how to build all the things for the tabernacle. So we have our two chief gentlemen here. All the gold prepared for the work in all the work of the set-apart place. And it was the gold of the wave offering came to be 29 talents and 730 shekels according to the shekel of the set-apart place. Okay, so now we're doing an inventory of the precious metals. And so the first one we're looking at is the gold here. And so all the things in the tabernacle that were um, either made of gold or overlaid with gold. So we have, of course, uh, the columns, you know, the walls, the frame of the dwelling place. We have the bars and the rings. Um, then we have the pillars that were made with gold. And then we have the three furnishings inside the set-apart place, the lampstand, the uh, table of showbread, the altar of incense, as well as inside the most set-apart place is the Ark of the Witness. And then we have here some utensils that were used uh, for the table of showbread. Uh, and then for the lampstand, we have the tray as well as its snuffer. All these were um, the gold items. And so uh, uh, the 29 talents and 730 shekels comes out in um, American values <laughs> to 2,187 pounds uh, or one and a quarter tons. And then the value in dollars is 60 million. 492,670, okay? So 60 million. All right, this is, I found this a fun fact. It comes out that of the 603,550 men, it would be $26 per man, okay? So that's not that much, right? You think 60 million, but per man it came out to $26, and I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> in Exodus 12, 35 to 36, they plundered, and they took gold and silver, and they estimated that if they took a ring from somebody, a ring would weigh somewhere from three to six ounces, okay? So per man, they were only required to give six hundredths of an ounce. So that's like really nothing. So like say someone couldn't even give that much. If another man gave three to six ounces, that's how they were able to come up to, with $26 per man, okay? So that, I found that a fun fact. <laughs> Moving on to our next metal. And the silver from the ones counted of the congregation was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels, according to the shekel of the set-apart place. A becca, half a shekel for a head, according to the shekel of the set-apart place, for everyone passing over to those counted, from 25 years old and above, for 603,550 men. And the hundred talents of silver were for casting the sockets of the set-apart place. And the bases of the veil, 100 sockets from the, 100, from the 100 talents, a talent for each socket. And of the 1,775 shekels, he made hooks for the columns and overlaid their tops and made bands for them. Okay, so here are all the items that were made out of the silver. And so um, we were talking about the sockets, and the, these are the sockets that the boards went into. And then these are also the bases of the columns. Um, <clears throat> this was the um, inner, inner column 
of, with the most set apart, the inner veil. And then for the columns in the courtyard, their bands were silver, and then also their hooks were silver. And so right here, what we're looking at is 6,723 pounds. And that came out to roughly $3 million. So that's a big difference from 60 million. <laughs> and the weight was a lot more though. It was four and a quarter tons, okay? And it came out to roughly $4 per man, okay? So not that much uh, when you have 603,550 men. So that was really good. I hope we get to that. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Okay, and so um, so th there was 100 talents for the 100 sockets um, that were used and for the bases there. So right there, that took up a lot of the silver. And now we'll go to our last medal, the bronze. And the bronze of the wave offering was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. And with it, he made the sockets for the door of the tent of meeting and the bronze altar and the bronze grating for it and all the utensils for the altar and the sockets for the courtyard all around and the bases for the courtyard gate and all the pegs for the dwelling place and all the pegs for the courtyard all around. Okay, so again, we're looking at uh, all the items uh, that are inventory that were made out of bronze. So we have, of course, the bronze altar. Um, then we have the bronze columns um, for the gate, and then the bronze basin, a bronze uh, pan for the ashes, uh, the bronze um, base there, and, and that one was the outer veil and then all the pegs were of bronze, and then the utensils used for the altar. So, you know, the fire holder, the fork, the shovel, all made out of bronze. So the bronze total weight was 5,300, and it came out to only $5,400. So not that much, but it weighed quite a bit. It was four tons. Okay, and then um, for the bronze, hold on one second, let me get to that. I want to tell you how much it was per person. <laughs> Came out to two, $2 per person. Okay, so you can see how that's very affordable between the gold and the silver and the bronze. That wasn't that much. It was actually less than a live stream supporter. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but look at what they did with it. It's amazing. Okay, so we've now looked at the metals and where they, what they were made into. Now we're going to move on to uh, the rest of the items that were inventoried. Chapter 39. And of the blue and purple and scarlet material, they made woven garments to do the service in the set-apart place. And they made the set-apart garments, which were for Aharon, as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. Okay, so again, these are the materials we had uh, seen that were made from, you know, the snails and the insects. So we have the blue or the tehelet. Uh, we have the purple, the argamon, and then the scarlet or the shiny. And then we have a holy ob here weaving that. Um, and then that was used to make things like the high priest garments. And we know some of the coverings and the gates were made from those colors as well. And he made the shoulder garment of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material, and of fine woven linen. And they beat out sheets of gold and cut it into threads to work it in with the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen, the work of a skilled workman. They made shoulder pieces for it to join 
yeah, for it to join it. It was joined at its two edges. And the embroidered band of his shoulder garment that was on it was of the same work of gold and blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And they made the shoham stones set in plated work of gold engraved as signets are engraved according to the names of the sons of Israel. And he put them on the shoulders of the shoulder garment, stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. Okay, so um, here are the visuals for um, what we just read. And so, as we said before, that those Shoham stones had the names of the 12 sons of uh, Jacob on there, or the children of Israel. And so, on one shoulder, we had Gad, Asher, then Yisiskar, then Zebulon, then Yosef, then Benimin. And then on the other shoulder, we had Reuben and Shimon, um, Levi, Yehuda, Dan, and Naphtali. Okay, and I read it right to left, but I, the order would have been the oldest to the youngest there. And then the, this is the Shoham stone, it's also known as onyx. And I thought this was cool. These are some new visuals that we have this year. These are the beaten gold sheets. And then they were made into gold threads. And then you can see them in here, you know, woven into the blue, the purple, and the scarlet material. So again, these, this was for comeliness and esteem. And you can see how this was just beautiful. You can just imagine seeing this in per person, how, how, um, how it was so just colorful and then just just really a sight to behold. And I could see how, you, you know, you give him a lot of respect because he was dressed so beautifully, you know. So nice thing to think about. <laughs> and he made the breastplate a work of a skilled workman, like the work of the shoulder garment of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen. It was square. They made the breastplate double, its length a span, its width a span, doubled. And they filled it with four rows of stones, a row of ruby, a topaz, and an emerald was the first row. And the second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a barrel, a shoham, and a jasper, set in plated work of gold in their settings. And the stones were according to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, engraved like a signet, each one with its own name according to the twelve tribes. Okay, so this is just the breastplate part here with the 12 stones in it. And again, it, this had the names of the children of Israel uh, on his heart when he walked around. Um, so it was doubled in material. And then uh, when Selena read that it was a span in length and width, that comes to, out to about eight inches. Okay, and so again, we have the names of the children of Israel. So in the first row, um, we have, um, well, I won't read it because we just did it. So, <laughs> but we'll move on to the next one because we have a lot of information tonight. And they made braided chains of corded work for the breastplate at the ends clean, of clean gold and they made two settings of gold and two gold rings and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And they put the two cords of gold in the two rings on the ends of the breastplate. And the two ends of the two cords, they fastened in the two settings and put them on the shoulder pieces of the shoulder garment in the front. And they made two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate, on the edge of it, which was on the inward side of the shoulder garment. 
And they made two gold rings and put them on the two shoulder pieces underneath the shoulder garment. On the front of it, close to its seam above the embroidered band of the shoulder garment. And they bound the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the shoulder garment with a blue cord so that it would be above the embroidered band of the shoulder garment and that the breastplate would not come loose from the shoulder garment as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. Okay, so um, Moshe had to inspect all this to make sure that uh, every um, detail was carried out. You know, where were those rings put? (laughs) Where were those settings put? Where were the gold braided cords put? Where was the blue cord put? You know, so Moshe had to inspect and make sure that it was all done correctly. And he made the robe of the shoulder garment of woven work, all of blue. And the opening of the robe was in the middle, like the opening in a scaled armor, with a woven binding all around the opening, so that it would not tear. And they made on the hem of the robe pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material twined. And they made bells of clean gold and put the bells between the pomegranates on the hem of the robe all around between the pomegranates. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all around the hem of the robe for the service as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And they made the long shirt of fine linen, the work of a weaver for Aharon and his sons, and a turban of fine linen, and the turban ornaments of fine linen, and short trousers of fine woven linen, and a girdle of fine woven linen with blue and purple and scarlet material, the work of an embroiderer, as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And they made the plate of the set-apart sign of dedication of clean gold, and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet, set apartness to Yahweh. And they put on it a blue cord to fasten it above on the turban as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. Okay, here, so we're just looking at Aharon's uh, priestly garments in these verses. And so um, his belt or sash was not white like the ordinary priest, like uh, Aharon's sons. So his was uh, colorful, and then he also had the the gold plate that said in Hebrew, Kodesh the Yahweh, and uh, so in English that would be set apartness to Yahweh. And then we talked about this before, about the, the bells and uh, how when Aharon would go into um, the set apart place, they would hear the bells <laughs> and know that he was okay that he had done the offerings correctly and that he was not killed by Yahweh. (laughs) And all the work of the dwelling place of the tent of meeting was completed, and the children of Israel did according to all that Yahweh had commanded Moshe. So they did. (laughs) <laughs> so I found this verse very, very important that the children of Israel did according to all that Yahweh had commanded Moshe. So just to mark this down in history, they did everything that Yahweh said. Maybe they didn't do it ever again, but when they built the tabernacle, they did. So there we go. <laughs> and they brought the dwelling place to Moshe, the tent and all its furnishings, its hooks, its boards, its bars, and its columns, and its sockets. Okay, so here's an inventory of all this. It would be really cool if I put every single one on there. It would just be like like filling up the whole slide (laughs) because there were so many of all of this. But this is just a sample of everything that they brought 
to Moshe. So Moshe was the inspector. He made sure that everything was there. Everything was accounted for. And I felt like this is like Ikea. They just brought you parts and you had to put it together. <laughs> and the covering of ram skins dyed red and the covering of fine leather and the veil of the covering. Okay, so in this verse we have uh, the mention of the coverings. I don't know why the other two coverings are not mentioned. They're actually not mentioned in this chapter. So we put it in there because I'm sure they brought all the coverings to him, not just two of the four. <laughs> the Ark of the Witness with its poles and the lid of atonement. Okay, so we're starting to bring now the furnishings, the items in the most set-apart place to Moshe. The table and all its utensils and the showbread. Okay, and now we're moving into the items that went into the set-apart place being brought. The clean lampstand with its lamps the lamps to be put in order, and all its utensils, and oil for the light. Okay, so the lampstand um, was brought in, and that it goes into the set-apart place, just like the table of showbread. And the altar of gold, and the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, and the covering for the tent door. Okay, so here's the last furnishing in the set of our place and all the items related to it as well. And then they grouped in <laughs> the tent door with this one. The bronze altar and its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils the basin with its stand. Okay, now we're moving out to the courtyard and then the items that were brought to Moshe for the courtyard. And so this is the, the bronze altar and the bronze basin and all the things related to the altar. The screens of the courtyard, its columns and its sockets, the covering for the courtyard gate, its cords, its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the dwelling place for the tent of meeting. Okay, so this is um, the, the courtyard itself that is now being brought to Moshe. The woven garments to do the service in the set-apart place. The set-apart garments for Aharon the priest and his son's garments to serve as priest. According to all that Yahweh had commanded Moshe, so the children of Israel did all the work. And Moshe looked over all the work and saw they did, they did it as Yahweh had commanded. So they had done. And Moshe blessed them. Okay, so the last thing that was brought to Moshe were the priestly garments. And so uh, he looked over all of them. And then he blessed the children of Israel because they were obedient. Um, in reading this uh, portion in chapter 38, 11 times it says, just as Yahweh had commanded. So you can find that phrase 11 times. Okay, and if you want to know where it is, go ahead and look at the Parsha Pearls <laughs> edition. <laughs> the children had to answer that last week. <laughs> Chapter 40, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, on the first day of the first month, you are to raise up the dwelling place of the tent of meeting and shall put, it, put in, it, in it the ark of the witness and the screen, oh, good grief. And screen the ark with the veil. And you shall bring in the table 
and arrange what belongs on it, and bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. And you shall set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the witness, and put up the covering of the door of the dwelling place. Okay. Excitement. It's finally happening. We're here. We're about to erect the dwelling place in the courtyard. It's been a year since they've left Mitzrayim. It's exciting. So, um, you know, they, he gives, Yahweh gives Moshe the order that he wants things put in the tabernacle. And so um, we're going to go ahead and look at that now. And you shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the dwelling place of the tent of meeting, and shall set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and shall put water therein. And you shall set up the courtyard all around, and shall place the covering of the courtyard gate." Okay, so after the dwelling place and its furnishings, we're setting up the courtyard and what goes in it, okay? So uh, the courtyard was to separate um, the dwelling place where Yahweh uh, met with his people and the encampment, okay? They couldn't just go in there and just, you know, hang out and socialize <laughs> like we do here. So, um, you know, there was a border put up. Sorry about that. <laughs> And shall take the anointing oil, and anoint the dwelling place, and all that is in it, and shall set it and all its utensils apart, and it shall be set apart. And you shall anoint the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and shall set the altar apart, and the altar shall be most set apart. And you shall anoint the basin and its stand, and set it apart." Okay, so after everything is put in its place, now uh, we're going to get into the ordination that's about to happen. And so Moshe was um, instructed to anoint with oil various items, okay? And so then this is uh, before the priesthood is ordained. So first the items are ordained, and then the priesthood will be ordained And you shall bring Aharon and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. And here's Moshe. He's doing the work as Yahweh had commanded him. And you shall put the set-apart garments on Aharon and anoint him and set him apart to serve as priest to me. Okay. So... Um, we're going to look at that um, again when we get into um, Leviticus, um, but this is the order. You know, after all the things that were set apart by the oil, now the humans are set apart for doing service with the set apart items. And you shall bring his sons and put long shirts on them, and shall anoint them as you anointed their father. And they shall serve as priests to me, and their anointing shall be for them an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Okay, so important thing to remember here that the priesthood is for Aharon and his sons. So you couldn't just aspire to be it if you weren't <laughs> from the lineage of Aharon, and he made that very clear. And Moshe did according to all that Yahweh had commanded him. So he did. Okay, so we have our Moshe here. And um, in chapter uh, 40, the phrase, uh, all that Yahweh had commanded him, is found eight times. Okay, so it's repeated because Yahweh wants to stress to us that when he calls his servants to do his work that they need to do all that he commanded 
not part of it, not just what they felt like doing. And if you're given a task here, right, shouldn't we do everything they say? You know, you don't just go and clean the nursery room a little bit. Clean the whole thing, right? I know that's never happened. <laughs> and it came to be in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the dwelling place was raised up. And Moshe raised up the dwelling place and placed its sockets and set up its boards and put in its bars and raised up its columns. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we've got the framework, right? So we're repeating here, and this is just giving detail by detail, you know, how it was all put together. And I believe that... <laughs> Most likely, Moshe didn't do this all by himself. He just supervised it. He made sure he was there to watch it. You know, he wasn't in the back room taking a break, having a coffee break. He was, he was watching it. <laughs> and spread the tent over the dwelling place and put the covering of the tent on top of it as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. Okay, so now uh, after the frame, we're going to go ahead and cover it, right? And so uh, these are the four coverings. And then again, that phrase, as Yahweh had commanded Moshe, it's in this verse. And he took the witness and put it into the ark. And he put the poles through the rings of the ark and put the lid of atonement on top of the ark. And brought the ark into the dwelling place and placed the veil of the covering to screen off the ark of the witness as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And he put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the dwelling place outside the veil and set the bread in order upon it before Yahweh as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And he put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the dwelling place and lit the lamps before Yahweh as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And he put the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the veil and burned sweet incense on it as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And he set up the covering to the door of the dwelling place. Okay, so there's our order there. Um, for what Moshe supervised there. And he put the altar of burnt offering before the door of the dwelling place of the tent of meeting and offered upon it the burnt offering and the grain offering as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. Okay, so we haven't looked at the offerings yet, but they're talking about the items that are going to be offered, some of the items that are going to be the type of offerings that are going to be offered. And we'll get into that next week when we um, look at Vayikra. And we'll go over all those offerings that you've always wanted to know about. <laughs> Fun facts. And again, the phrase, as Yahweh had commanded Moshe, is in this verse as well. And he put the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water therein for washing. Okay, so we had our bronze altar, now our uh, basin being put in the uh, courtyard there. And Moshe and Aharon and his sons washed their hands and their feet with water from it. And they went into the tent of meeting, and as they came near the altar, they would wash as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. <laughs> and there's that phrase again, as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. You know, this instruction was to Moshe. He spoke to Moshe. And he raised up the courtyard all around the dwelling place and the altar and placed the covering of the courtyard gate. And Moshe completed the work. Okay. So here it is. The work is completed, and now they can enjoy it and learn about the offerings that are going to be done in um, the courtyard. 
And the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the esteem of Yahweh filled the dwelling place. And Moshe was not able to come into the tent of meeting, because the cloud dwelt on it. And the esteem of Yahweh filled the dwelling place. And when the cloud was taken up from above the dwelling place, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Yahweh was on the dwelling place by day, and fire was on it by night, before the eyes of all the house of Israel in all their journeys. <laughs> so here we have um, Yahweh's presence, the column of cloud, and then the column of the pillar of fire by night. And so... Um, before we conclude, um, as I said, this is part of the YM2OI program, and so I want to show you with our lovely uh, Miss Sarah Beth Ott. She's going to come up here and show us the crafts uh, for the Little Gems um, um, program, as well as the Katan B craft that they are going to be doing tomorrow for Parsha Peku Day. And so the first one we're going to show you is the, the cloud, and then it flips around to become a pillar of fire. <laughs> oh, we're not on yet. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have what the children will do is they're going to trace their hand on cardboard. <laughs> and that's how we're going to get the shape of the column of uh, cloud, the pillar of cloud. And then you flip it over, and the tissue, uh, the orange and the red, is the fire. And then the cloud is soft cotton balls. <laughs> so that's their craft. And then wait till you see this, Katan B gets to actually make the tabernacle and the courtyard there. So we have there in the front the, the bronze altar. Is the basin there? Oh, I, oh yeah, it's hard to see it because it's, I guess you've got to tilt it a little. <laughs> there it is. There's your basin. <laughs> and then you have the dwelling place. And then we have um, your pillar of fire. So we have Aish in Hebrew for fire, and then you can flip that around, and then you have the Hebrew word for cloud, Anan, okay? And then if you take the covering off, you can see inside there, we actually spared no detail. Every attention to detail, just like Yahweh. <laughs> so we have the set-apart place there with the three furnishings. Um, yeah, they're tiny. <laughs> Um, you're going to have fun making those. But you have little fingers. You should, no problem. <laughs> so you have the incense altar. You have the table of showbread and the lampstand in the most set, in the set apart place. And then behind the inner veil with the caravim, you have the Ark of the Witness there uh, with the caravim on that too. So really nice craft. And was it you that designed all that? Yeah, very talented. Thank you, Selena. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so whenever we finish a book of the Torah, we end it with saying this expression. Is it on there? Are you? They're gonna put it. They're gonna put it on there, so we can all say it together. Hazak, hazak, venit hazek. Be strong, be strong, and be strengthened. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, fantastic job by Rebbe's and Julie and Selena. And also a little assistance from Sarah Beth. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give them a second to clear out the tables and the chairs here. All right, chazak, chazak. May we be strengthened by what we heard, right? By being in the, in the word and 
recounting the Exodus story and, and all the things and the events that happened there, especially at the end there, all of the things related to the tabernacle. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to bring Brianna up to do the announcements, and then we will go into our Midrash portion. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We'll start by welcoming our guests. Since we are children of Avraham, we like to exemplify his world-renowned trait of hospitality. So we like to start every time with our announcements by welcoming all of you who are joining us for the first time online. And I don't think we have anyone in the room. Oh, but we have new family members. I don't say I wouldn't say guests. <laughs> new family members. Um, so we'd like to introduce to you what we provide as a ministry. So our first thing that I'm going to talk about is our YouTube live streams. We do these twice a week, the first one being our Shabbat service, which you can join tomorrow and every Shabbat going forward at 1.15. And so online, the room opens up at 1 o'clock, and you can go ahead and chat with some people and get to know each other. And then here we uh, allow people to come at 12.30. Is that right? No, in the room. Yeah, here locally you can come at 12.30. And then the service goes typically till around 5.30. And it, it's a really great, um, the way we have it is that you can spend most of your Shabbat during the service so that we have lots to do and lots to learn. So definitely join us for that tomorrow. Then right now we're doing our Torah study, which we do every Friday night. And here locally we have an Arab Shabbat meal at 6 p.m., and so definitely, uh, if you move here, that's something to look forward to. The live stream for the Torah study starts at 7.30. And during the study, we go over that week's Torah portion. And right now, we're having a special edition, I guess. <laughs> we're having Revis and Julie and Selena Stevenson do a presentation for the Torah study. So that's really a wonderful job they do. But yes, so we went over Pekude, and then after that, Rabbi is going to give us his notes that he took on the study, and then after that, he opens up the floor for any questions that you may have. So definitely get those ready, because you're up after that. <laughs> so if you want to follow along with the parshas that we do, we have a schedule available on the website. You can download that as a PDF form. This is under the Resources tab. So the Torah portion schedule has Genesis through Deuteronomy. It's a yearly cycle, and the dates on the side of that, so that you know when we're doing them, they correspond to the Torah study. So it's super simple for you. So today's should have today's date, um, Peku Day, and then you can um, look to the next one and go ahead and start reading it so that you're ready for the next Torah study. We also, on the Torah portion schedule, have the Hof Torah portions and the Brit Kadasha. And that's all for you guys. <laughs> then for the children, which you got to see a little bit today, we have the Parsha Pearls program run by Revis and Julie. <laughs> so this is a program designed especially for the children to learn the Parshas at their level. And so they have their own website for this because there's a lot for them. So we, we are very happy for this to be provided for us, for you guys, for free. And so this is on ymci.org. The Y in front stands for young. And so we split the content for the Parsh Pearls into two different age groups. We have the Gem Seekers, which is ages not, uh, five through eight, and the Pearl Seekers, which is ages nine through 99 plus. Really, it's more like nine through 19. But we do just put 99 plus because we think really anyone can engage in and really learn something from this program, especially since today we saw how in-depth they go into all the details of the things that were going on in the Torah portion. So definitely check that out for yourself, or you can definitely check it out for your children because... Uh, if your little ones, they, you, you don't know what to do, 
during the large part of Shabbat. <laughs> we have lots to do in these lessons. We have child-friendly stories and lessons, lesson questions, Hebrew word studies, memory verses, word searches, crossword puzzles, mazes, crafts, notebook pages, coloring pages, songs, and a snack. And again, this is all related to that week's Torah portion. And so the parshas are posted at the beginning of every week on Sundays so that you can have access to them throughout the week. So while you're reading, your children can also be learning the program and the Parsha. And so if you have any questions about anything that I just said or when you're looking through, you can email parshapearlsmty.org and Rebus and Julie will gladly answer any questions that you may have. All right, next we have audio scripture readings provided by Ms. Shira Wenling. She did a fantastic job of reading everything, Genesis through Revelation, and she also read the first five books according to their Torah portion. So that's really wonderful if you're wanting to listen to the Torah portion throughout the week and, you know, hear how she, she reads it really well. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, you would think it would be nice, but, like, she has this voice that really resonates with me. So definitely check that out and listen to that throughout the week. For our YouTube, we have posts, we post once during the week. Oh my gosh, I said that so badly. <laughs> we said we post Monday through Friday, uh, and then you get videos Monday through Friday. Uh, we have on Mondays the first look, which is just a preview to the teaching that I posted later in the week, just to get you a little bit excited about that. Then on Tuesdays, we get the YouTube Shorts and Rabbi Trails, and these are 10 videos each, so 20 total, and they're one-minute-long segments taken from previous teachings, so definitely check those out. Then on Wednesdays, we get our full teaching, and we got, this week, gems from Jude from Rabbi Tom. So if you haven't seen it already, go ahead and check that out. And, and then be ready for next Wednesday when we get another teaching. And on Thursdays, we get the afterburn session, which is the Q&A part of the teaching. So if you want to see the Q&A from Gems from Jude, you can also check that out because that was posted this Thursday. And lastly, Fridays, we get the In Focus videos, which are short videos that are taken from teachings that have a pretty important topic, so much so that we think we should just make a separate video so that you can listen to that alone and you don't have to try to find it in the teaching since they are an hour long. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to find specific parts, so we try to make it a little bit easier and put it in these videos called In Focus. On social media, we're on Facebook as MTY Worldwide, and TikTok and Instagram, we're MTY underscore worldwide. And so definitely check those out if you're ready on those platforms. And follow these platforms, and also on YouTube, you can subscribe. And that also makes it a little bit easier for people to find us if they're looking on YouTube. The more people follow even I mean we say oh we're not into the numbers but YouTube's into the numbers so <laughs> I have to say it this way um, the algorithm really it kind of matters when it comes to subscribing and likes and other things so if you feel so in your heart moved to subscribe or hit like that's just another way that you can support us without really having to do much that's it's pretty simple <laughs> All right, we have our own MTY app with over 4,900 downloads. So let's hit 5,000 tomorrow. <laughs> so go get your phone out. It's available if you have an Android or an Apple, <laughs> anything you have. And go ahead and download the MTY app. Let's see if you're up your if you're up to the challenge. Um, on the NTY app, we have literally everything that has to do with our ministry on there. So it's all in one spot, it's super easy. It makes everything super accessible for you. And also on the app, Rabbi sends out Shabbat Shalom's on there. He, he did send that out uh, during the study. So if you got the notification, good. If you didn't, uh, you need to probably turn on your notifications, which how you do that is you go to the profile button and then you go to the app's notifications and then you scroll the button 
that says general and then it should turn green. And then you will get notifications anytime Rabbi sends out something or we have a new teaching. And it just makes it really easy for you to know when we have anything going on. All right, next, for our teenagers, we have our Torah Teens class with Rabbi Tom. So these meetings are every Thursday at 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. And so for, the, so for these, they're for the teenagers. So this is ages 13 through 19. And so if you're interested in joining, this is on Zoom. So to get a link to the meeting, you email tourtime at mty.org, and you'll get an autoresponder link, and that's it. And you can use that for all of the meetings going forward. Another thing that we do on Zoom I'm going to talk about our zone meetings. So we are an international ministry, and so Rabbi decided to make it a little bit easier for them to engage with him on their t during their Shabbat, during their time, because right now it it's Shabbat for us, but people way, way different time zone, it's already past their Shabbat. So he wants to make it a lot easier for them to engage. So once a month, he split the world into three different zones. So tonight, which you all should be there, we're doing zone three. So the party doesn't end after this. <laughs> it's just getting started. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> so this is going to be tonight, and it'll be at 10 p.m., and so this will be right after the study. And this is for the time zones and I'm just going to list a few. We have a lot more, and I don't know them off the top of my head. But we have Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Philippines, Malaysia, and much more. They get to ask their questions during the meeting. Everyone from any zone is very much so encouraged to come. We love it if you come because it's a great opportunity to be with all of our mishpacha from everywhere. Because this is just a small portion of the world in this room. Like, teeny tiny. We have so many people everywhere else. This was really great to see them, their questions, how Rabbi interacts, and it's just a great little intimate type meeting because it's not recorded live, so it just feels very special to me. So definitely come to that tonight. This will be on Zoom. So to join this meeting, everyone will, if you don't have the link, you will email zoom at mty.org. You will get an autoresponder link, and then that will be used for zone three meetings and zone two meetings, and now zone one meetings. So <laughs> this is the same link for all of them. So see you then, but don't leave yet. <laughs> then we have zone one. This will be on April 13th. This will be for the local Beth Shalomers to ask their questions. So yay. And usually um, it alternates. So the other time zones for zone one would be United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, and Central America. And they got to ask their questions last Shabbat. So that was really awesome if you got to see that. If not, we are going to post a teaching called In the Zone where you get to see all that. All right. So this zone one is the only one that is live streamed on YouTube. All the other ones are on Zoom. So keep that in mind. It will be taking place during the regular teaching time. So instead of a teaching, you get to ask your questions if you're here locally. Sorry to everyone else. <laughs> All right. Then we have zone two. This is going to be that same day, April 13th, at 10 a.m. And so this is for the time zones, United Kingdom, Europe, Africa. They get to ask their questions. And again, everybody from anywhere is encouraged to come. If you have any additional questions, you don't want to bring them to a zone meeting, you can go to our contact us page on our website, or you can email questions at mty.org. All right, next we have Purim coming up. So this will be on Sunday, March 24th at 5 p.m. This is for the local Beshalomers. And so we will have our meal, and we have all the details on the Beth Shalom Facebook page. So, or the Facebook group, not a page. There's a difference. Anyway, on the group, definitely check that out. And Rebison put all of the details when it comes to, like, what food and everything. And then also, please tell her how many of you are coming, because it just makes it easier for her. So definitely check that out. 
um, and go ahead and do that as soon as possible. <laughs> Next, we have the Pesach craft prep party. And so this is for the YMTI program. We have all the ladies and Gadol age girls. They are going to be able, or please come and help us uh, cut out. We're going to be making it a little bit easier for the YMTI program to get the crafts done. So we do a lot of prep beh behind the scenes, kind of. So if you come, that would be great. It'll be just the ladies and Gadol age girls. No children, please. And also, oh, and let me say when it is. Okay, so Sunday, March 31st at 10 a.m. And also we will have brunch items. So we'll have food and we can work and dance. But that's, if you know, you know. <laughs> it's on the down low. Okay. <laughs> All right. Why does it say the next slide is the connect slide? Okay, never mind. Next is Rosh Kodesh for Aviv, and this will be Tuesday, April 9th, and this, the live stream will be at 7 p.m., so definitely come to that because there's always a lot of good things that Rabbi says after the service, because the service is pretty short, but definitely come to that. Also, if you're here locally, we bring desserts to share afterwards. Oh, <laughs> this is an opportunity for you to get rid of all your leavening, all your leavened desserts. <laughs> Bring your stuff. <laughs> all right, then we have the leadership council meeting. It's going to be April 14th at 12 p.m. These occur every, every month, once a month. And so we announce this so that you can mark this date on your calendar and be praying for the leadership in the meetings because they're trying to come in, in honor of the Father to best serve the body. And so it's just right for us to be praying that Abba inspires them to do so. All right, next we have Pesach coming up. Okay, so this is April 22nd through the 30th. And if you're on any of the social media platforms, I did put out a little post about it because we do have a deadline of April 1st. And so uh, definitely try to get your registration and everything by before then. Um, we do understand that things do happen, like such as you need approval from work and it, it happens kind of after the deadline. And But if you end up missing the deadline, you do have to reach out to us by our number, which I feel like I should have memorized by now, 423-250-3020. Uh, and, oh, nice, they put it on the screen. Okay. Um, <laughs> so reach out to us because uh, there is limited availability, but we can try to see if we can work something out if you do end up having to miss the deadline. But please try to just get everything in, be proactive, and let's get this done. Do I have to do the angry face? <laughs> but, that's, that, but that's the next part of this. <laughs> this is the volunteer calls. Oh, wait, I'm not done with pass, Passover. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> Okay, volunteers have come, are coming. So, if you haven't gotten scheduled for your three mandatory shifts, you're going to have to get them filled because they're mandatory. But also, you should want to do this. You should. It should be in your heart to serve. But you have to get it done. I wonder where she gets that from. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yes. Be aware that the 423 number that I already said is going to probably be from us, and it should be saved in your phone because, I mean, I just think it should be in your saved in your phone. But if you miss the call, check your voicemail because there is going to be a voicemail, or better yet, be proactive and call because Miss Heather Blue will be very happy if you do that. <laughs> our, our favorite ones are the ones that don't have their voicemail set up where it says their voicemail is full. Those, oh. those are the best. Yes, so call. Get it done. Write it down. Put it in your calendar. Don't forget what you signed up for. We're counting on you. 
I mean, we really are. We're counting on you to be there if you sign up for it. Um, so yes, please. We're a body and we're all moving parts. So every part is important. So please uh, be proactive, get it done, and also note that it's three. And if you have a child in the program, you have to at least do one, uh, be help one time in the classes because that's what we have for the parents of children. Also, you have to get two other shifts filled if you do one of the children's. So, no excuses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I try not to even, I, I sometimes try to excuse myself, but I also tried to go and talk to Miss Heather and get myself scheduled, even though I'm doing a lot of things. So, don't excuse yourself because you think, oh, I'm busy, because you got this. We all got this. We're a team. Okay, and that's it for that part, I think. Okay, next is the Building Projects Fundraiser. Yay! So if you would like to make a pledge towards our new facility buildings that we're trying to do at the property, you can go to the website, which I, I recommend doing it that way, because if you've not seen any of the videos before, which I'm not sure if you have or not, but there is videos on the website on the building projects page that you can watch of the facilities, because it's gorgeous. And you can also see Rabbi explaining it more in depth, like all the different ways about I didn't say that right, but Rabbi explains how to do the pledges and everything really in depth in that video. So if you want to check that out, definitely go there. But you can also send an email to pledges at mty.org with your specific pledge amount and which gem that you pick. So if you go to the next screen, nice. There is all these different gems that we chose with ranges of amounts that you can pick to pledge with. Um, so at the very bottom, you see stream support team. That's so that uh, everyone who watches online, if you just want to give like 100 towards it, he has that there. Also, we have all the other options there. So depending on what you pick, you can uh, go to the form at the bottom of the page and you type in, let's say, Ruby 1, and then you type in also the amount because it is a range. So... Rabbi, unlike you might think, oh, he is a mind reader. He is not a mind reader. <laughs> so pick a specific amount. And then also, if you want to start giving towards it, if you click on the whatever one you want, like Ruby One, it will send you to the uh, subsplash. And it literally already shows, like, here's the amount that you chose. And then you just type in whatever you want to give. But also, if you just decide to go on Subsplash and give whatever amount, also state in your pledge or pledges at m2i.org what you're giving towards because, again, Rabbi doesn't know unless you say. Right. <laughs> okay. Also, um, another thing to note with that is this has to be above and beyond what you would normally give for tithes and offerings because the bank already knows what normally is coming through. So if you're deciding to give, it can't just be like instead of your tithes and offerings. It has to be, again, above and beyond what you would normally give. And also, pledge to right now, we have over 1 million 50,000. Did I say that better? Yep. I said it wrong last time. 1 million 50,000. Woo! <laughs> And this is from over 348 donors. Yay. Yay. Right, That's good it. Job. Good job, Brianna. Shabbat shalom. All right. So a couple of things just to clarify or add to with the announcements. Um, so with the pledges, because we just finished that, uh, with the pledges, again, I love that a lot of people are sending in their pledges. That's great. I really appreciate that. We had wanted 50% of whatever you pledge. Now, a lot of the smaller ones have already sent in just the whole amount in one shot, and that's great. Okay, so if you get an email that says, it's kind of like an autoresponder. It's not. I just kind of copy and paste the standard response that says, hey, you have up to the next three years to pay this off, and you've already paid it. Just know that at least I'm getting the email that you pledged, okay? 
And no, you don't have to send me a copy of the receipt that you pledged, because I know that you pledged, because <laughs> I'm going to get the subsplash report, okay? But let's say you're doing Sapphire 1, which is 2000 to whatever, 4999 Okay, but then Sapphire 1, if, you're, if you go to subsplash to pledge, it's going to give you the range. You can still put $100 towards it, and we just will credit that towards your, whatever your pledge was. But I still need the email that says, hey, I'm pledging 3000 or 2500 or whatever. Or I'm not just, uh, if you don't tell me, I'm just going to assume it's the bottom. I'm assuming you're pledging the lowest of you if you didn't say what number it was, okay? So if you say stream support and you're planning to give $1,000, I'm thinking you're only giving 100 unless you tell me otherwise, all right? Now, of course, whatever you give is still the level you're going to end up at, which is why, you know, you get an email that will say, look, you can always change and increase your pledge at any point because it's where you end up that matters, not what you said you would end up. Because maybe something happens and you end up with some extra funds somewhere and that's good. Now, one of the things that needs to be clarified also is, okay, because people are asking these questions and I need to, <laughs> I was gonna say, I need to smack this so it doesn't happen. I need to stop this. You guys are just not understanding tithing, okay? There are three tithes that are for three very specific things. So you cannot ask to redirect any of those three to something else. Because some of you are saying, well, if I have extra second tithe, can I put that in towards the pledge? No. It's for second tithe. Well, I don't need it all. Well, then you're supposed to put it in the offering at some point, and it just goes into the offering. It doesn't become your pledge. Because you were supposed to already do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, let's say you happen to have, let's say you make $30,000 a year and you have $3,000 a second tithe and at the end of uh, Sukkot you still have $1,000 left. Well, then that's something you would just put as an offering. You don't get to say, I'd like to put that so I can get all this credit, but it's for tithe, it's not for the pledge fund. Does that make any sense to anybody? You can please get that, okay? So don't ask me if you can redirect towards the fund. This is asking, as Moses was told to ask, those whose hearts are moved for this very specific thing. The thing they were giving towards wasn't a tithe. Didn't have anything to do with the tithing system. They made an offering, okay? All right, let's just be clear. I understand what you're trying to do, because all of you would love to be on the board and see your name up there if that's what you want. Not everybody. Some people ask not to be, and it has to be anonymous. A lot of people want to do that. If you want to help us, just give the money as your tithe is supposed to. That will still help us. Because trust me when I tell you, most of the money to build this project is not coming out of the pledges. It's coming out of the general fund that we've collected over the years and saved up for this project. Okay? And so that all goes towards the project anyway. If you're just wanting your ego and your, you know, just to have your name on it, well then donate something specific for the project. Okay? Don't try to redirect your funds because those funds should be exclusively for what they're supposed to be. Okay? Now, all right, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Uh, by the way, I love that both my wife and my daughter, when they do the announcements, are getting really, really comfortable to show their personalities. I mean, it's just, it's such a, a joy to see them, you know, just owning that this is their time to do the announcements their way. So that's fantastic. So Brianna did a great job. I really, great job. Now you better. Especially when she said she was going to give you the mean face, which when she was a little baby I called the cute face. But, and she hated that, because <laughs> she would glare at me, and I was like, oh man, that's so cute. And she would think I'm supposed to be like scared by the mean face. But anyway, of course she thought that only because she did it to mom, mom would be like, oh, you know, and pretend to be afraid of it. Then she'd try it on me and I'd laugh and think she was cute. Anyway, I know that shocks all of you, <laughs> which only made her more mad at me. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's the cutest thing ever, you know glaring at me with the, what's supposed to be the scary face, you know. Anyway, um, okay, so there was something else that I wanted to say in here. And by the way, let's, let's talk about the volunteer thing for a minute. If, if, you're, if that bothered you, if you don't like hearing it or whatever, if you're not going to volunteer, I don't understand what you're doing, okay? I mean, I know you're coming to something called Passover or Sukkot or Shavuot. You're coming to a feast. But I don't think you understand. You're not coming to like an event where you're going to sit and be entertained and then you go home and you're just fed. Like this isn't a, a conference. Okay? You pay for a conference. They take care of everything. You just pay to show up. Right? This is a family gathering. 
okay? A family gathering. Now, I guess, you know what I could do, Elder? This is what we could do. We could give them a choice. Either they could all volunteer, or I add a zero on the end of the registration fee. And then we'll do everything. So the $200 becomes $2,000 per person. I mean, we could do that. And then, then you don't have to do anything. I mean, I, do you understand that I don't get to sit in on anything? Elder doesn't get to sit in on anything? We're working the entire week. Rebbitson's working the entire week. Shamash Uncle Bob in the kitchen works the entire week. And some of you are thinking, well, I'm going to miss two things, oh, three things. I've got to volunteer three times. Really? The reason you're going to enjoy the event is because there are people volunteering so that the Everything's cleaned up, so with the janitorial team, and that there are people on safety to make sure you're safe, and there's people doing all the other things, volunteering with everything else, that everything works. The kitchen, the kitchen team does an amazing job, and we have great food. As a matter of fact, that team, I don't have any have to ask them to volunteer. Once they start, they want to do it every year. They, you can't get them out of there. They're like, pre-sign me up, I'm doing the kitchen. I don't know why, they just love being in there. There's a camaraderie they have in the kitchen, okay? And believe me, it's not always fun as you're sitting there chopping things for an hour. All right? But it, it is what it is. The thing is, I don't get your mindsets. Do you not understand that we're supposed to be transforming from receivers to providers to givers? We shouldn't have to beg. We should have to be turning people away. And there are a few of you that we have to do that because you want to serve six, seven, eight times during the feast. And I'm like, no, I need to give these slots to other people. Okay? Anyway. And of course, there's always going to be the few that are going to come and never volunteer. I will know who you are. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do with that information, but I will know who you are. Instead of having a donor wall, we'll have a wall of shame. These are all people that always come and never do anything. I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. Okay? But you should absolutely be ashamed of yourself. I have people who are physically handicapped that volunteer. Okay? Okay? Matter of fact, they insist. Give me something to do. I could sit at the registration desk. I could check people in at the meals. I could do something. Okay? I've seen people with walkers standing at the, in the kitchen chopping stuff. Okay? I mean, look, what, nobody's making them do any of this stuff. They want to help, they want to be a part of this. And I, you know, some of you are going, well, I thought you were going to get into Midrash. Well, there's a whole lot to say in the Midrash that actually all of it in the Midrash is going to have to do with what I'm saying right now, which is all the people did what Moses said. That's part of what's in my discussion here. It's not just that they did all what Yahweh said, but Yahweh told Moses and Moses said it. Okay, that's a little bit different, okay? You know, the end of verse 32, it says, and the children of Israel did all according to what Yahweh had commanded Moshe, who told them, so they did. And I'm telling you, you guys need to transform, and part of that is through volunteering. Okay? It's not because I want to take advantage of you in some way. I'm trying to bless you in some way. Okay? We don't need you to volunteer. We could do it a different way, and, and a few people want to do it all the time. I, I could have them do that, and we could, you know, even pay some people to do it and take care of some of that. We charge you more. But... Wouldn't you want to, you know? I don't understand. Okay. So that's why we say all of that, all right? And it's funny because I've done this at Feast after we still were needing more, because we're still going to end up needing more people who don't show up. And that's the other part of it. You'll volunteer and not show up. Those people should be flogged, okay? I mean, why do you volunteer and not show up? Now, some of you have an actual legitimate emergency, something happens. But there are others of you who just forgot. Oh, I forgot, all right? Would you like it if we forgot for whatever it is you came to enjoy? Oh, we forgot. Sorry. Forgot we offered you, a, you know, a, a, an open Q&A midrash in the afternoon. I just forgot about it. It didn't show up. You know. Okay? The, um, was there anything else I wanted to say about any of this? No, I guess that was pretty much it. Okay. Let's now go into the discussion. All right? Let me get my scripture out here. Again, Rebitson and her team did an amazing job explaining all of the stuff, and that was just fantastic. Okay. 
And always very exciting when we finish a book. So we did finally finish Shemot, so this is kind of exciting there. Okay, so I only have a few references here, and it's really all about basically the same idea. Two of them about the same idea, one about a different idea, but still the same theme is in there, all right? So I already read you from verse 32 of chapter 39 that all the work of the dwelling place of the tent of meeting was completed, and the children of Israel did according to all that Yahweh commanded Moshe, so they did. Now I want to bring this to a slightly different angle. So first, the very straightforward angle is they did what they were told by Yahweh, but they did it because Moses said it. Okay, so they were submitted to that. But I'm going to take this from a slightly different angle. Because it says, and all the work of the dwelling place, the tent of meeting was completed. Are we not supposed to be the tent of the dwelling place, so to speak? Well, when it's completed, only those who did complete it will be those that did according to all that Yahweh had commanded Moshe. Ooh. You'll need that for tomorrow's discussion when I do this, the teaching tomorrow. I'm going to maybe remember to bring that in there. You guys have to understand, it's completed, that's the point. And it was completed because there was submission to the authority. There was obedience. Okay, that's the piece that sometimes people miss. And then we get to 42 to thir- uh, 43, and Moshe looked over all the work and saw that they did it as Yahweh had commanded. So he looked it over, which is something Reverend pointed out, so they had done. So look. Moshe verified that they had done all that, I, that was commanded. In other words, he had the authority and responsibility to check and look over. Okay? So let that be a lesson to all of you. If I walk in the room, no matter what you're doing, if it's part of this ministry, I can look it over and make sure you're doing it according to what I wanted. Okay? I don't care if it's out in the safety team. I've had to correct some things. I don't care if it's in janitorial. I've had to correct some things. I don't care if it's in the kitchen. Any area, I've had to go, uh uh-uh, uh, why is this? What's wrong? I mean, but it's my responsibility. Some of you are going to get all bent out of shape if that happens. Don't get bent out of shape if that happens. It's actually here. It says it's, it's my job. Moshe had to verify. By the way, it doesn't say here that anything, by the way, do you think when he verified, that he, do you think it was only at the end when it was completed? All the way along. Do you think there was any moments where he said, what are you doing? Do you think that happened maybe a couple times? Okay? Do you think he was really super, like, sweet, nice about it? I'm not saying he was mean about it. I'm just saying, do you think he really parsed his words because he was worried about everybody's feelings? All right? Because some of you have a real problem because correction will come from me or from Elder, and you get your feelings all hurt. And by the way, he's doing it almost as much as I am now because he has to deal with... People, you know, he's the first line of defense, so to speak. So a lot of times he has to deal with it and rather put it on my plate. He knows what I'm going to do, so he does it. And so you got to know that it's still coming from a loving place. Remember, it says every father that loves his son is going to chasten him or correct him. Okay? And by the way, when he's doing it, he's not really all that concerned about your feelings. I'm just saying. They're just concerned. By the way, they're concerned about you, not your feelings. Do you understand? I had a conversation today with somebody who didn't necessarily love everything I had to say. And I wasn't necessarily all that gentle about it because they needed to hear something. But I said to the person, I am talking to you like I would talk to my own child. Okay? My own adult child. Let me say this to be clear. I'm not talking to you like you're a child. But if you were my child, I would be talking to you this way. See, but some of you don't like that. Because you have this idea that, oh, but where's your fruit of the Spirit? That is my fruit of the Spirit. Okay, And by the way, some of you, if you would stick around long enough, would see the end of that. Elder talks about that. We're talking about this today. But what happens is people bail out because of the chastisement, and they don't get to the compassion that I show at the end of that. But you got to take the correction first, which is really not a correction. It's getting your head realigned straight so you're focusing on the right things. So I'm sure Moses had to walk around and go, That's not what I said, okay? Why is that over there? Well, you know, you could have you could have pulled me off to the side and not said that in front of somebody. Well, no. What? Why do you have so much sensitivities? All of you, okay? And if you think I'm talking about you, I probably am. But I'm talking about all of you. This happens every day. Elder can tell you. Every day we have this problem, okay? Because people get hung up on the delivery system. Whatever that is. 
okay? It can't. You can't do that. The delivery system, do you read your book? Do you have any really th thoughts that when you hear Yahweh speaking that he's being so all concerned with everybody's feelings? Do you, anywhere do you really think that that sounds that way? You worm, Jacob! <laughs> Go to Isaiah where he calls him a worm. It's really a maggot. It's talking about like the things that are in dead things. You, I'm holding your hand and you're whining like a little baby and you're crying and afraid and you maggot. And you're, and you're all mad at me. Seriously? He said, he said to about the earliest people that he made, he said, I'm sorry I made you. Then he said about the people that Moses did, he said, you guys are rebellious from the day I, I knew you. You stiff neck, you know. <laughs> but, oh, but you're all picturing, oh, you stiff necked and you're, you know, but I love you. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It's okay. No, he says, if you don't listen, I'm going to curse you. And if you don't listen, I'm going to curse you seven times more. And if you don't listen, I'm going to curse you seven times more. Oh, well, that's not fair and not nice. You hurt my feelings. You don't love me anymore. You know. So I don't know why. Okay, I don't know why that's going on. There's way too much talking going on somewhere back there. Okay? All right. You guys need to understand. The tone is always love. But, I mean, the message is always love, but the tone can be anything. But you're going to read the tone. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. When Yahweh said, if you don't listen, I'm going to curse you seven times, do you think he was angry? No. But you could think that, wouldn't you? I mean, the tone sounds angry. I got people accusing me of being angry all the time. Elder could tell you. People say, why are you angry? I'm not angry. It just sounds angry to you. Strong sounds angry to people. Intense sounds angry. Yahweh was intense and strong. He wanted to make sure you understood. I mean what I'm saying right now. That doesn't mean he was angry. See, that's why I kind of liked what my daughter did when she was doing the announcements is that she came up and she kind of kept changing her tone of voice a little bit and tried to... Because I do that to make, an, to make a point. When I look at you and say, what are you doing? You say, wow, man, why are you so angry? I'm not angry. I'm trying to get your attention. And by the way, if you're really paying attention, I'll go from that to this almost immediately. That gear shift is because I wasn't angry. I was making a point. So I can get in your face and then talk like this right after that. And you guys have all seen me do that if you've actually met with me. Because you need that verbal smack sometimes. But you'll be like, man, how am I so angry? Unless you're a password not working, I'm never angry. Okay? Ask Elder if I'm ever angry. Okay? When it comes to people. And he says all the time, he says, Rabbi, you're more patient than me. You're more just, you know, because I don't get angry. It just sounds that way to you, okay? Because you're not used to. How do I say this without you thinking I'm being all cocky and stuff? You, there are not very many real men with strength and intensity where it needs to be. So you're not used to hearing that. Because the only time you hear anything like that is some crazy abusive person who really is angry and is going to just be abusive. So you link what I'm doing to that because you don't know what to do with an actually strong person who has some intensity and fire to make a point but actually isn't being what you're afraid of. Actually still is actually trying to be there for you, take care of you, provide for you, wake you up, get you to do what you need to do. Okay? Instead, a lot of people hang up before we get there and they just think, well, you know, I said, well, you should have stuck it through. Because at the end, I'll say, okay, now that you get it, this is what you need to now do. This is where we're going to go. But you had to understand. You're coming to me first, not owning what you're doing, not even understanding where the problem is. You know? And all I want to say is figure it out. And you're like, but that's, I don't know what to do. Well, figure it out. Well, how do I figure it out? Figure it out. Look, I, 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 I'm confident 
and, and people are going to laugh. I'm not trying to make a joke here. I'm confident that literally zero of you are morons. Okay? But you actually act like you are. When you say, oh, I don't know what to do. No, you don't know what to do. I get that. So go figure it out. How do you do that? You've got a phone. Google it. Whatever the thing is. YouTube, it's something. I mean, go ask somebody for advice and guidance. But figure, figure it out. You know. Okay, don't act like you're stupid. You're not stupid. Okay? You are not giving yourself credit that you can do more than you think you can do. And then you call us and you are absolutely pathetic. At least that's what it sounds like to me. It's like absolute, 40 years old and, oh, are you kidding me? Come on. If you want to come to me, hey, I've been trying and it's not working and I keep trying this, not working, I don't know what's wrong with it, that's fine. I don't know what to do. I expect that from my five-year-old, okay? And even with my five-year-old, my son used to get these kits for the Lego. I've told this story. And then he'd be following the instructions, which was just pictures, put this next, put this next. And almost always, at some point early on, he'll come to me and say, I need help. And I'm usually busy with something. I say, I'll be right there. But then I end up taking too long for him, and he's already figured it out. And then I go to him, hey, did you need help? Nope, done, finished, the whole thing's good. So you know what happened? Eventually, I just gave, said I'm not available because I knew he'd figure it out. I didn't just say figure it out. I, then he realized eventually he didn't need to come to me because he could figure it out. Now, he could have jumped to the conclusion, I don't care, I don't want to help him. Or he could understand that I am looking at it from a bigger zoomed out position because I want him to figure it out. Okay? And now he's stronger for it. See, if I help you guys when you need to figure it out, I'm hurting you. It's like pulling that caterpillar out of the cocoon before it's a butterfly working its way out because it needs to break its way free. Because if you break it free, it doesn't get what has to happen when the liquids get squeezed through its wings to force them. I mean, there's something happens squeezing out of the thing that if you rip the thing open, that thing is never going to fly. Okay? And you think, but I wanted you to help me. I am helping you. You just don't understand it. Okay? See, all the stuff here in the end of chapter 39 is all about authority and the recognition of authority. They finally got to the point where the thing got complete because they listened. You're going to end up complete because you're going to listen to what Yahweh said through Yeshua, through a teacher. That's how you become complete. All right? But if you don't have, let's reverse it. There's you, teacher, Yeshua, Yahweh. All right? So if you don't have that aligned, you're not going to get complete. And by the way, I didn't say any one of these is going to do anything for you. They're going to provide you with what you need so that you can do it. Nobody above you is going to do what you need to do for yourself. The Father is never going to do what you need to do. The Son is never going to do what you need to do. We only provide for people in areas that they can't do. Okay? But you'll come to me for things you must figure out, or you'll never make it. You must. I'll tell you right now, don't ever call here asking for any kind of benevolent financial help unless you have a plan for why you're not going to need it again next month. Do you understand what I'm saying? Or that you need it for a short term, but you have a plan to fix the problem. Because being broke isn't the problem. Being not able to have food or whatever, that's not the problem. That's a symptom of the problem. And you guys want us to fix your symptom. And that's a black hole that never ends. I can throw as much money in as, as effort, and it'll never go, it'll, it'll never satisfy. But you come to saying, but I don't know how to fix the problem. Well, that's a start. At least understand that the problem is yours to figure out. But then what do I do? I don't know what I'm doing. Figure something out and then bring that something up the chain and say, what do you think of this as a solution? Don't ask me to give you the solution. Go find one. It may not be the right one. It may not even work. But at least find something and bring it to me and let me tell you, yeah, I think that'll work or not. And if I tell you it'll work, great, do it. If I tell you it won't work, maybe you've got to go out and find another one. 
But at least now you know one thing that doesn't work. <laughs> then you come back again and maybe that, now you know two things maybe that don't work. So you're learning. And you're all like, what does that have to do with the Torah portion? Don't you think all of this happened while they were trying to build the tabernacle? Over and over again, they were trying something. And by the way, I'm not even talking about Moses now. I'm talking about going to like Betzalel or Haliav. Is this how you wanted this weaving to go? Is this how you wanted this thing to go? Am I doing this right? Remember, because they were supposed to teach the others how to do these things. So now you got the chain going down again to the teacher. The teacher could be the person teaching you how to weave, teaching you how to make things out of metals, teaching you how to make things out of wood, right? That's still the teacher who's expecting you to do what they say to do, the way they said to do it, okay? And so you need to be able to ask, is this what you wanted, all right? I had a real hard time with one supervisor once who put me in a position, gave me an opportunity to do a specific thing, and I said, and how would you like that to look? And they looked at me like, just do it. But I knew full well if I just did it, there was a good shot, it was not gonna be the what they wanted. And we got a little frustrated battle. I said, so I wanna say, if I, I wanna simply say, if I do this, is that gonna work? I mean, I, mean, I wanna make sure this is what you wanted. It had to do with picking who had to work and who didn't have to work on a day that everybody wanted off. You know, if you've ever been in a job where somebody wants Thanksgiving off or whatever day off, and, but you're going to be open that day, and you've got to figure out who gets to work and who doesn't. So the supervisor said to me, you get to decide that? I said, thanks. Everybody's going to be mad at me, which is what they wanted. I said, but is there a way that I can say, see, I wanted to be able to say this is the way the boss wanted. See, I wanted that. Okay. So I had to put together a little thing and said, hey, is this, is this going to be what you want? All right? And, you know, we played the little battle because I think she was simply trying to offload it on me so she could have the deniability that she had. Any, oh, I didn't have anything to do with that. That was Steve's idea, you know? <laughs> but you should be doing that. You should always be making sure, is this what you want? Is always what you ask up the line. Okay? But doesn't mean necessarily asking, what do you want? Okay? If they already gave you something, they say, is there, is there anything, then say, is there something specific about this or the way you want it that, you know? And they might say, well, all right, go ahead and put something together and then show it to me and I'll let you know if that's what I'm looking for. Sometimes they'll tell you that. I give you the freedom to be creative up to a point, show it to me, I'll let you know if that's what I wanted. Because maybe I don't know exactly what I want until I see it, okay? So Moshe verified, just understand this to me this is in Scripture where it says this actually. This is my interpretation. This to me means I have a responsibility to verify, okay? To, to oversee and verify certain things. Now, I'm not going to be cultishly coming into your life and asking you what you're doing at home and how you're keeping Torah, but things that happen here are my responsibility, okay? And I verify to make sure. Elder will say, and some of you know this, if you come to a feast, the two of us, and even when I'm not here, he'll do it, every hour, pretty much, we walk around the entire site making sure everything's going fine. Mostly they ask if anybody needs anything from us or from somebody else that we can make sure it gets done, but we're overseeing and double-checking to make sure that everything's going smoothly. And when I'm here, we both go around everywhere We'll go to the kitchen, we come to the building, we go to the classrooms, we go to the safety, we go to the, we, we check everything, the bathrooms, whatever. Our responsibility is to verify. So you don't like to have us looking over your shoulders, so we're not, we're there to verify. We want you to be successful doing the thing you're doing. But I don't want to be corrected. Get over it. Everything in here is constant correction because you're always off. All of you fall short. We all sin and fall short. on our, So you're going to get correction like every day. Get over it. <laughs> oh my gosh, just get over it. My feelings. Stop letting them run your life. Okay, I'm not saying not to have any, but stop being ruled by them. Okay? Man, you know. It's, it's, really, it's really hard sometimes to be in that supervisor, watching you guys struggle so much with your feelings. Okay? All right. You know, it used to be, just to give you an example of how bad this was, used to be that I would 
kind of voice out loud how much help I needed with certain things. And there were people saying, well, why don't you ever ask me to help you? And, I, and, and one person finally came up and said, well, I wanted to volunteer. I could do that. Why wouldn't you let me? I said, you don't understand. If I, if I let you do it, and when you mess up, which you will, everybody does at some point, I'm going to go to correct you, and you're going to turn into a puddle of feelings. Okay? Which has happened almost every time. Okay? And then, but I already can tell with certain people that's going to happen. Because they're already in their feelings all the time anyway. So I'm like, what in the world is going to happen when I come to you going, what are you doing? That's not... Did it with one person. They didn't come back for six months. I gave them very specific instructions. I want this and this. I came the next week to see what, and it wasn't what I asked for. I said, where's the thing I asked for? Oh, well, I thought I'd just do this this way, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted this. Where is it? Well, it's not here. And they're like, why are you so angry? Because you need to know you didn't follow directions and you didn't bring what I asked you to do. Because I needed this. I didn't need this other stuff. That's nice that you did it. This is what I told you I needed. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? It's like if I asked you to clean the bathroom and instead you cleaned the classrooms and the offices, which is nice, but I asked you to clean the bathroom. So when I come in and go, what happened to the bathroom? You're like, oh, well, you know, I thought I'd do that after I did that, and I never got to it. But I told you the priority. So you're going to mess up. Guess what happens when you mess up? You're going to get corrected. Guess what's going to happen then? A choice. You're going to have a choice of what you're going to do when correction comes. You're going to get upset. You're going to get defensive. You're going to have an emotional outbreak. Or you're going to say, I'm sorry, you're right. I got to fix this. Now, if you're having an emotional moment, you can't even think that the other person's right. That, that part of you is blocked. <laughs> you're just now mad that someone's talking to you. How dare he talk to me like that? Oh, well. <laughs> I was like, oh, well. I mean, I, I, you know what I wish? I wish all of you could hear his voice when you disappoint him, and then you tremble. Because I'm sure it's not that sweet, soft voice you think it would be. It would be more like, we'll pick any kind of name, you know, Joe, Bob, whatever, Mary Sue. What, what was that you did today? Why would you do that? You know you shouldn't do that. You know. You don't think it would sound like something like that? I tried to whisper in your ear the still small voice. You ignored me. I think he would sound like that. He would be like, um, you know, earlier today I tried to get your attention and, you know, I'm just a little disappointed that you didn't listen. And no, it would be more like, what the, what are you doing? Some of you are like, he would never sound like that. He invented language. You don't think he knows all the words? <laughs> oh, some of the faces you guys all made just now. All right. Because some of you look at me like, I can't believe you're a rabbi. How can you talk the way you... How do you get away with that? Look, he put me here, so get mad at him, all right? Take it up with the boss, okay? I'm not the boss. All right, now, so then we get to, again, the same idea in four, chapter 40, verse 16. And Moshe did according to all that Yahweh had commanded him, so he did. So it's got to start... And really, we're reading this later into 40 from 39. So he has to do everything Yahweh says, and then the expectation is that the people then would do everything he says. Okay? But that also means that the trust has to go up the same way. The people have to trust that Moses is doing what Yahweh said. Moses has to trust, or we have to trust Yeshua is doing it, as we keep going up, right? To the Father. Because we know the instructions coming to Moses is really from the Son. The Father's not the one talking to him right here. Okay, go listen to the Do You Know the Father and the Son teaching. So each level is trusting the next level above is doing it in line with the Father or whoever's above them next, okay? Ultimately to the Father, okay? And so we get these rare verses that show people actually did what they were told. And those are celebrated verses because, wow, I mean, this is not something you see all the time. And certainly we're not going to see a whole lot of it when we start to get into numbers, Okay? And other parts of Levit Leviticus even, we're going to see there's a little bit of problems with obedience and following instruction. 
All right, 9.30, okay. Last piece of this puzzle, okay? Last couple of verses in chapter 40, all right? Now, so it says here, we'll read uh, 36, and when the cloud was taken up from above the dwelling place, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Yahweh was on the dwelling place by day, the fire was on it by night, before the eyes of all the house of Israel in all their journeys. All right, so this is what I want to make sure that's clear, okay? Now, the cloud of Yahweh was on the dwelling place. And the people had their eyes on it. They saw it. Okay, so the question is, can you find this quote-unquote cloud today? In other words, is this literal? Yes. But is there anything that it's also hinting at for us today? In other words, is there a way to see, what does the cloud represent? His presence, his authority. Because it would be over the tent of meeting, over the dwelling place. Because he even said that Moses couldn't go in when it was there. Okay? Because it was like, you know, okay, you can't go in there. But yet, they were always aware of its location. Okay? They could see it at night as a fire. They could see it during the day as a cloud. And when it moved, they moved. Okay? So, the question is, not only can you found the, find this cloud today, in other words, his presence, but can his presence be seen by your eyes? Do you know what you're looking for? And we're not talking about somebody talking in tongues or rolling on the floor, some other thing that manifests something. I mean, can you see his presence? What does his presence look like? Authority. Can you see his hand somewhere in a place? Does that make any sense? Now, that's only if we're going to assume this is pointing at something that would be relevant still today when we're not dealing with the actual tabernacle or the Mishkan in the wilderness, and we're certainly not dealing with the temple that was destroyed that was in Jerusalem, okay? So what would, where does that leave us today? Do we still not look for his presence and see if that presence is there or if it moves, all right? Some of you thought that presence was in the church you were in, and then you realized it wasn't. So you went looking for that presence. And by the way, that presence, did it say that if the people didn't like Moses, they could leave, or they're just waiting on the presence to move? So it doesn't matter who the person is, like Moses is doing the leading at that point, right? They're going where the presence is, which means that if the presence moves, they have to go to where it's going because they want to be where that authority is, that leadership is, and so this is why I think it's really important, you know, because the mindset, and again, this is going to sound all cultish, you whatevers, okay? Why would you not understand, well, let me rephrase this. I don't understand why you don't get that it matters where you go, okay? I mean, I know why you think that from the point of view of culturally, you were raised where, hey, you just went to the local church because it was a local church. And if there were three or four churches to choose from, you picked the one you preferred. Generally speaking, you didn't drive real far to find a church if you had choices where you were. And so they seem to be somewhat interchangeable. Does that make sense? Like, okay, so this one doesn't work, I'll go across the street to the other one. But it wasn't about identifying his presence. And some of you out there are going to a place just because your emotional need to be with some people is overriding the reality that you know the presence isn't there. Okay? And people call here on a regular basis to have this discussion with us. You know, well, you know, I go to this place, and yeah, I know their teaching's terrible, and they're just singing kumbaya in a circle or whatever, but I, then why do you go? Well, because my other choice is to watch you on a screen. I'd rather watch us on a screen. Okay, I mean, if, if I was, you know, I'm not saying because it's me. I'd rather watch something that I think has actually got the presence, teaches the truth, is doing, than sit in a building. I could not sit in a building knowing that I'm hearing nonsense. That's wasting my time and isn't helping me grow. Okay? My wife can verify that because we used to go to a congregation for a little while in New York, and I said, I can't do this. Okay? I can't sit here and listen to the stuff that's coming out of this guy's mouth. And it wasn't like, 
you know, 100% terrible, awful stuff. No place really is that way. But I just said, I can't do this. It's not right. It's not helping me. It's, I can't sit here. It was, not, it was just irritating me all the time. Now, I wasn't sitting here mad at the guy for being wrong. I just said, I can't sit and listen to it. You want to be wrong, be wrong all you want. I can't sit here. Okay? And it wasn't judgmental. Pay attention. I didn't judge what he was doing. I judged that I could not do it. I made a judgment call. I can't sit here. You know, we have family members that still were, back when we first came out, we're still in the Worldwide Church of God, spit off the United Church of God, whatever. And I told her, after I did Beware False Prophets, I said, I can't go in there and hear Jesus' name all the time. Not that it's like, you know, blasphemy or something that way, but it's just, I can't, I can't sit and do that. Okay? I know people can. I can't do that. And they're the ones walking around, like a lot of these churches, claiming we're the one true blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but the presence isn't there, okay? Look, I'm not going to claim anything. I'm just going to make an observation. I can't understand, other than the presence being here, why all you people have moved here for this. I mean, why would a bunch of people move to Cleveland, Tennessee? <laughs> I bet you most of you didn't even know Cleveland, Tennessee was a place before you found this teachings, these teachings, right? I didn't know this was a place when I lived in Chattanooga until my wife got a job in Cleveland. I said, where's your job? She goes, Cleveland. I said, in Ohio? <laughs> we live in Chattanooga. That's 10 hours away. She knows. She said, no, it's Cleveland. It's like 15 minutes. I was like, what? I didn't know. I mean, I promise you, I didn't have in my yearbook in high school saying most likely to end up in Cleveland, Tennessee. Also, it didn't say most likely to be a rabbi either, but you know. Okay. Um, but again, this discernment, listen to what it says. It says that the, the, this is, uh, the fire and everything was before the eyes of the house of Israel. They had to recognize the fire and the cloud. Okay? Now, I know usually I throw a little joke. There's other clouds you could follow. Okay? But that could be any place that has a different authority under it. Or it's under a different authority. Okay? Or over it is a different authority. And you should know, or at least be seeking to know, the difference. All right? And again, it's not about the personality. Because I can promise you, Moses is probably a lot like me. Okay? I'm not trying to claim anything, but I'm sure the man who was as violent as he was and killed that guy and everything else, had a temper, struck the rock. What I say is a lot like meaning you would not love him as your pastor rabbi. Okay? I don't think he walked around with any warm fuzzies going on. Can you see him as a warm, fuzzy guy? Okay? All right? So, just, you know, bear in mind, it's not that delivery that you should be looking at. Where's his presence? How do you know what his presence is? Where is his teaching coming out? Where is his message coming out? Where is, where is his instruction? Where is the guidance to become him happening? Okay? And I don't mean just i got to make it a little more clear, because that is happening even in the churches this much, but where's the unadulterated happening? You could go to a messy Christian place. It could be a mess of Costal, it could be a mess of Baptist, it could be a mess of whatever, a mess of Jewish. It could, be, it could be every possible little thing, but is it the Torah-observant, covenanting, linked with belief in Messiah, without all that other stuff, Okay? And that's what you need to be looking for. That's my opinion, okay? Because we're to follow the presence, whether it's the fire or the cloud. It's the presence. Because the reason they followed it is because he moved. Not because some fire moved. Because they knew that fire represented him, okay? And so that's, this, is on your, this is on your plate. Okay, you guys have to do this. You have to, this is on you. Okay, you have to ask these questions of him, find it, and when you find it, stop being so. I mean, we've got three or 400 people that have been here and left, and they've all left over not understanding the presence is here, they just didn't like me. Okay? Which is foolish in the extreme as far as I'm concerned. Okay? 
they were just not emotionally able to make those right decisions. Because you know why I know this? Because most of them have ended up nowhere. Because if they really just wanted a different voice, they'd have found one. And most of them have not, from what I know. Okay? As a matter of fact, a lot of them are closet watchers of me. <laughs> they watch anyway. You know why? Because they know, but they just don't want to admit it. They're too embarrassed to come and say, I'm sorry, and I'm wrong, or whatever. And they all think I, I'm going to be like, bite their head off if they come back. No, I'm going to give you a hug and say, good, it's about time, and that's it. Because you guys don't, you know what the problem is? Just like you don't know him, you guys really don't know me. Okay? Few of you know me because you spend enough time. But the other rest of you don't know me. All you people on live stream who've never been here, you don't know me. You think you do. Okay? Now, when I tell you I'm the same away from the mic as at the mic, well, that part you know. But you don't know me when push comes to shove and when you have a real need and when you need it. You don't know what I'm like. Rocky will get up here all he, all he does and say how I, I, you know, I comforted him in the parking lot. But none of you who, who have never experienced it, you're going to really understand or believe that. You, know, you can't picture that. You struggle to picture that. Like, Rabbi did what? Okay? But, but see, when, if you ask Elder, while I'm beating somebody's stupidity down, he knows at the same time I'm trying to figure out a way to help them that doesn't hurt them. They don't know that's happening behind the scenes. He does, because he's watched me do it a lot. But while I'm giving him all this, no, that's you. Why did you do this? How come it took you this long? What have you been doing? I had a lady sit in the crying corner, single mom, and she told me she hasn't been working since March. This is now like September, October. And I said to her, and I got in her face, I said, what the hell have you been doing for the last eight months? <laughs> you are a single mom. You have nothing? This is before COVID. There was jobs. There was no reason why there wasn't jobs. There's jobs now, too. What I'm just saying is, now, I would have still tried to figure out a way to help if there was a way that would help her without hurting her, but I had to start off with the wake-up call, you need to own what you've done and why you're in your problem. But what you guys can't picture is behind all that, my brain mechanisms are running hard trying to figure out how can I help this person without hurting them? By hurting them meaning enabling or entitling, okay, that hurts you. And Elder's sitting there going, I wonder how this is going to work. Because he knows I'm going to get there. He just doesn't know how I'm going to get there. Okay? And it usually comes out, he's like, okay, didn't see that coming. And I didn't necessarily either, because the, me the mechanisms are running trying to figure it out while this is all happening. Because that's my compassion that you don't know about. Okay? Now, some of you know because you've experienced it. Most of you don't know. Because all you're hearing is me calling you out, for what you're doing, so you own what you did, you own why you're in the stuff you're in, <laughs> okay? You know, somewhere I wrote down a note. There's some of you that, are, that are, came from the spiritualized stuff, okay? You know the phrase, stuff happens, okay? It's not demon poop. I actually wrote that down one day, okay? It's mostly it's dumb things you did, or it's just time and chance. If it's time and chance, why are you upset about it? And if it's dumb things you did, yeah, someone's got to make a meme. You know, stuff happens, it's not demon poop, okay? Because I was tired of people always telling me that, you know, some demon or this or that did all whatever things in their life. And I said, stop that. I had a lady tell me that she was cursed because of these things she did when she wasn't covenanted. I said, that's not how cursing works. He uses the curses for covenanted people doing dumb stuff to get their attention. So every dumb thing you did before you had any idea there was a creator and Torah and all this other stuff, you're not being cursed for that. Now, you may be dealing with consequences of your actions. Those are just consequences. But stop saying you're cursed. Curse is a weak, blank excuse <laughs> to justify your behavior. It's just weak. Well, I'm in this place because I'm being... No, you're in this place because you didn't get off your butt and do something. And own it and fix it. And by fix it, that doesn't mean you have to do it yourself. Go get guidance. Get advice. By advice, I don't mean just say, oh, you know, I don't know what to do. Get from like, like, don't go with nothing. Okay? 
Don't go with nothing. At least go and say, these are the things I've tried. They're not working. What am I missing? Something. Okay? And some of you, I, 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 again, I don't know why this is what the, the direction is going, but this is, what, this is what we get every week all the time, so it must be stuff we need to talk about. Some of you have got to move. I don't even mean here. If you can't get anything done where you live, move. Well, there's no jobs. Move. I got people telling me they can't make any money, there's no jobs, because they live in a place with 12 other people. Like the whole town is 100 people. Like, well, there's no jobs. How about moving somewhere where there's something to do? Oh, I live in this country where the government, then move. I mean, I don't understand. We're reading a book about how the whole nation moved. <laughs> okay? And they're going to move. Go read Numbers 33 and see how many times they moved. It lists them all, right? Okay? Why are you so stuck in a place? Move. But my family, friend. okay, but you're miserable, so either make a choice. All right, this should also be a meme. I've said it a thousand times, but you guys need to really hear this, okay? Everything that's going on in your life, either A, this is choice A or number one, have peace with it. Whatever it is, just have peace with it. Or B, fix it in some way. In other words, fix it where you are, or fix it by moving, or fix it. Some of you are in bad marriages. Either fix it and stay married, or fix it and get divorced, or have peace with it just being what it is. But you guys have to stop whining and staying wherever you are in your situation. If your situation is a physical location, if your situation is a marriage, if your situation is a job, anything that's terrible and not working, don't stay there or have peace with it, one or the other. Do you understand? But you call and we tell you what to do, but you now start defending where you are. I said, then have peace with it. But you don't. You don't have peace, but you don't want to go do something to fix it, you know. I got all these married people having issues. They said, fine, fix it. How do I fix it? Then I give them instruction how they can fix it. Or fix it by splitting up. Then you still don't have what you're having right now. Or if you don't want to do either of those, just be okay with it. Have peace with it. Just accept this is what my marriage is, okay? But you can't do that. None of you can handle that level of irritation, whether it's your job, your location, your marriage, whatever it is. Relationships with your kids. I mean, I have people with adult kids they're having a fit with. I said, or their parents are older and you're older and you're having a fit with. Well, look, you either have to fix it or end it, like create heavy boundaries, okay? But don't sit there, you know, and, and not have peace with it. You have to, that's the only choice you have. You can't, the choice of being miserable and staying in your situation is really a terrible idea. And if you are going to do that, please don't call me. I don't want to hear you staying miserable and having no interest in fixing it. Okay? Because then all you want to do is vent to me about and whine about how your life is so terrible. Okay? I'm sorry. Go, go pay somebody professionally. They'll listen to you. $150 an hour, they'll listen to you. Okay? You can tell them anything you want, whine all day. They don't care. $150 bucks an hour, I'll listen to you. Actually, I still wouldn't. You couldn't pay me enough. Okay? I'd rather work at McDonald's and say, do you want fries with that than get $150 an hour to listen to that. I'm serious. I'd rather get minimum wage working at McDonald's and listen to that drivel. Okay? Because it's pathetic. Now, I'm not saying being upset is pathetic. I'm saying being upset and having really no interest in fixing it. You know, all you want to do is complain about it. All right? And that's why we've actually had to tell a few people, don't call here anymore about this, this situation. I don't want to hear it unless you're ready to fix it. If all you're going to do is keep calling and not doing anything about it, don't call. We've already heard this 67 times. I don't want to hear it again. As a matter of fact, we should have only heard it 65 times less. Maybe twice it would have been enough. Once and then the second time to say, okay, that's enough. All right? Anyway, all right. If anybody wants to come up and has the courage to do so after everything I just said... You're welcome to do so. Otherwise, live streamers, I've got like 15 minutes. We've got to get to zone three. All right? Showing Elder I did not forget, <laughs> which is rare because I... And by the way, by the time we get to 10 o'clock, I'm sure I will forget. But anyway, okay. Janet, go ahead. Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so when you were talking about how, 
how Yahweh and Yeshua, they, don't, they will not do for us what we cannot, should do, must do, right? So I was, not what you cannot do. He's not going to do what you need to do. What, what we need to, yeah, yeah, what we need to do, right. Um, so and, and so you were saying, you know, if you have some, figure it out, right? Well, you know, I've been working on a specific issue, a specific project, not an issue, with my practice. And I hired these people, and they're basically coaching me, but they're not doing it for me, obviously. Right. So I have to come up with pretty much everything. And it's right. really it's really stretching my, my brain because I have to come with a whole idea, a whole program. You have to create my own, you know what I mean? And so it's hard to do, to do it on your own, but you know what? Uh, it's worth it because once I have it and I've been working on it, I'm seeing the pieces coming up and... Um, you know, kind of birthing this new this project and knowing that putting everything I got into it uh, is worth it because once you figure it out, whatever it is in your life, then you know it and you can handle it. You know right. what I mean? Right. On your own. So I, I really like that idea about figuring it out. Um, I have a question about the anointing. When, well, hold on. Let me just talk oh. about the figuring it out thing real quick. I'm going to give you a simple example. Yeah. Okay, because I have a keyboard, a piano right here. Let's say you, said, you came up with the idea that you want to learn how to play the piano. You want, to be a, you want to play piano, right? Now, would it be wonderful if someone just went poof and you could just play piano? Okay? But that's not the way it works. So you, you decide you want to learn how to play piano. So then you have to ask the question, okay, well, how do I get to do that? Well, first of all, I probably need a piano or a keyboard or something, right, to, to play on. Then I probably need to figure out the instructions, I mean, I guess I could watch some YouTubers, I could maybe get a teacher, I could, right? So you start asking questions about how can I do this? Because you have to figure it out. Then you have to then take whatever is instruction given to you and actually apply it and practice. Because I can teach you, for example, how to play certain instruments, I can play a lot of them, but you're not going to be able to play them very well if you don't actually practice and, and, and learn to use what I taught you. Okay, I could teach you where to put your fingers on a, guitar, on a guitar, but you won't be able to play those chords very well if you don't practice, okay? And so the work still has to be done by you. You can't expect others to do these things because you will never really develop the talents and skills to where they can be without putting in that effort, all right? Okay, my daughter plays an amazing ukulele. All we did was buy her one. Actually, somebody gave her one to start with. And you know what she did? She looked up things online, she did other, and she figured it out. She's never had a lesson, but she's had a lot of lessons. She just didn't have a formal instructional experience. Does that make sense? I've played drums here at this building. I've never had a lesson, but I've learned and studied and asked questions and observed. And, so I figured it out without a formal lesson ever. I'm not, that's not bragging. I'm not a very good drummer. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? What I'm just saying is, you, if I wanted to be, though, I could have gotten more lessons and gotten more practice. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, that was just from what little I did when I was much younger. But I still figured it out. I figured out who has the information I need, how can I get it, and what do I need to do, what equipment do I need. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's every area of your life. Your marriage is not that good. Fine. Where do you find out information on how to fix that? I struggle with... Boundaries, where do you get information to fix that? I struggle with overreacting to things. Where do you get the information to fix that? I struggle with food and eating and diet. Where do you get instruction to fix that? It's not like you have to, in the old days, go to a library and figure out the Dewey Decimal System to find a book. You got a phone. Just, if you got an iPhone, you just go, hey, Siri, how do I do this? And they'll give you 15 different options on how to do it. Okay, just type into Google. You know, where can I find information to deal with boundaries? And you'll get books and websites and YouTube channels and everything. I mean, this is not tough, <laughs> okay? Well, I don't know what to do for my career. Type that in. How do I find out what's the best way to figure out what I can do for my career? You know there's about 800 books in the bookstore that you can go to a bookstore and see on how to figure out what you want to do with your career? There's not a lack of those things, all right? 
Well, I got a lot of debt. There's enough books and other things that teach you how to get out of debt. It doesn't matter what you're in. And you guys act like, well, I don't know what to do. No, you know what it is? You don't know what you want. Because if you knew what you wanted and actually wanted it bad enough, you'd figure it out. Okay? You'd figure it out. But you have to want it. So you come to me, your problem is you don't know what you want. You just know you don't want where you are now. Well, I don't like this. Okay, but what do you want it to look like? Because you can't even believe anything else is possible, so you don't even have an aim at anything. Okay? I've been beating this so hard, I'm going to say it one more time now, because I know I'm wasting a little bit of time, it sounds like, but this is so important. I don't care how old you are, you should have an idea of where you want to be in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, okay, if you're old enough that you can still have to keep going. I mean, if you're 20 years old, you should know where you're going to be when you're 60. What do you want life to look like at 60, at 50, at 40? Problem is, as you get older, you show up at 30, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't plan to be this way at 30. I thought I'd be, but you never aimed at anything. Because you never thought about what you want. Because you know what, you're so busy right now, dealing with what you want right now. But does what you want right now fit into what you're gonna want when you're 25, 30, 35, whatever, okay? I'm right now very actively thinking about 70, 80, and more, okay? And working very hard to make sure that lifestyle is going to be what I want. And right now, I'm pretty much enjoying the life I was hoping to have at 60, and I worked hard to get to this, because I knew what I wanted for this. But most of you guys struggle because you have no idea what you want, okay? And you haven't prioritized getting your life to be what you wanted it to be. And so you sit there just miserable, well, my life sucks. Well, if you want it to not suck, how about aiming at something instead of just wanting it not to suck? What do you want it to look like? What do you want your relationship to look like? What do you want your health to look like? What do you want? This is the whole level up class, by the way. If you took that class, some of you guys take the class and still come back to me and like, go back and watch the class again. It's all there. And then you start talking to me like, didn't you take the class? Go back. That's the problem when people take classes, though. They go through it, thought it was interesting, and then they ignored the fact that there was a, it's supposed to be a lifetime of ap application in that. All right? Let me ask a quick question just to prove my point. How many of you have ever decided you wanted to have a budget? Every hand. How many of you actually have a working budget? You guys all went through my class and elders' class, okay? By working budget, that means I should be able to ask you exactly how much you spend every month and you should be able to answer the question. Okay? Because I get people tell me, well, I have a budget. Really? How much do you spend a month? Um, uh, um, because you don't. You don't know. Don't tell me you have a budget. By the way, do you understand a budget is pre-spending your money? So having a plan for your life 10 years from now, how about pre-doing all the things now so that you end up there? Okay? Plan, just like you plan every month where your money's going to go if you have a budget. Plan everything you're going to do that's supposed to get you to the next, you know, the next destination. If you're 50 years old, the next destination is 60 years old. But you should be thinking further, 70, 80, 90, whatever, okay? A lot of people live in a 90 these days and more. All right. Don't arrive there broke not knowing what to do. Big problem in this country right now is people outliving their money because they got their retirement set up thinking that at 65 they could retire and not expecting to be older than 80. Because that's not the amount of money that was put aside. Because most people, when I was a kid, the lifespan was 72. Wow. That was the life expectancy for men was 72. Eight, women was a little older, okay? Now it's much older than that now. But if you were, you know, planning for 72 and now you're living to be 85, you got a problem because you didn't put enough money away. And so you didn't plan for that. And now you're hoping to somehow make it through. <clears throat> Let's turn this into the scriptural part. You're trying to figure out how to be Torah observant today. But you're going to have to try to finish and complete, like we read in the Moses, that they had to complete the process, which means you have to get to the end. Endure, receive the crown of life, right? That teaching. Are you planning for that? You're so wrapped up in now, you know, that now has to be a stepping stone to the, where you're going, right? All right, go ahead. Rabbi, quick question. So when Rabbitson was talking about Shemot 49, 11, when um, 
they had to anoint with oil all the different parts of the... Uh, right. Right? So... 39.11. 39.11, okay. Okay, not 49. There's no 49. 40, no, 49. 9 through 11. Yeah, 9 okay, through 11. Okay. That's what I meant. 49 through 11. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, so... 40 chapters. It can't be 49. Chapter 40, right. Okay. So, with, um, with, the, with the oil, you know, I, I guess I got... My mind went back to the dark age in my life when I was a Christian, right? And we... In the Christian church, people would actually anoint you, anoint you with oil, and they would bless objects, and they would do all these things, right? right. But this is not blessing the objects. This is setting them apart for a specific purpose. That is correct. Exactly. Okay, got it. That is correct. Just like this, like there was anointing of the uh, high priest and the sons, okay? There was, this is all to be the idea of setting it apart, okay? Okay, Rocky, and you get to be quick and last because okay. I'm not going to get to 10 o'clock otherwise. Go That's ahead. That's fine. I, I, I'm surprised you didn't mention it, but <clears throat> there's really like four basic teachings, and, and if you don't get them, <clears throat> you're not going to get this. And it's, are you saved? Do you know the Father and Son? Are you covenanted? And the heart of the matter. Thank you. I may. You left one out. Is that quick enough? Yeah, but you left one out. Oh. Fear of Yahweh. Yeah. Fear of Yahweh. Because that's the starting point of everything. So it's five. I like your list. I just, you left one out. Because if you don't have fear of Yahweh, none of the other stuff is going to matter. Because you're not going to want to do any of the other stuff. Okay? It's got to start with the fear of Yahweh, which is why Deuteronomy 10, 12, what's the first thing? The fear of Yahweh. Okay? And now Israel, what, is, what does Yahweh want of you? To fear him. So fear of Yahweh has to be the first one. Okay? You need that one, but yes, you've nailed the other ones. That absolutely, if you don't understand covenant, you don't understand the heart issues. If you don't understand who the Father and the Son is, okay, and you don't understand the are oh, you say the whole salvation process, you're not going to get this, okay. But if you understand those five teachings, you'll want the rest of them, and you'll figure out how to walk in all His ways. You'll figure out the other teachings, okay. So excellent, excellent. All right, anything really, really quick, Rob, before we go ahead and close. Well, we really only just have one. Just came okay. up. Matthew A. He says, Rabbi, would you consider the precise settings of Aaron's garments being, quote unquote, knit together with gold bands and such, or metaphorically a shadow of the spiritual body of Messiah being knit together? I can, I can go with that, I suppose. I hadn't really thought about it, but certainly the idea that could work, okay? All right. All right. We're going to close here. If you'll all rise, we have Mr. Oscar Ortiz going to close us in prayer. Baruch Hashem, blessed El. Once again, we just thank you, Father, for this opportunity of coming before you as a family, getting to break your word open together and understanding it with its simplicity and in clarity. And we're thankful once again for the leadership that you've placed us under that isn't afraid to share that truth with us, that is willing to be something that others aren't willing to do out of fear or out of popularity, but they do it because they love us, they care for us, and they want what's good for us. They want us to walk this walk out the way that it needs to be walked out. And so we're thankful for that. We appreciate that. And we just give you the glory and the honor because you have brought this forth. Thank you, our King. Thank you, our Master, for it is in the power and authority of your Son and our Mashiach Yeshua that we've come before you now. Thankful and appreciative. Amen. The amen. 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 All right. Anybody wants to be on camera, come on this side. While they're walking over here, this reminded me of something. I was talking to a lady one time, and she said to me, oh, I don't think anybody's ever talked to me like that. I said, that's the problem. <laughs> you probably needed somebody to talk to you like that a long time ago. Okay. All right. So they got everybody coming over. What do I got? Oh, Mateo's over here. Good boy. All right, that's my buddy right there. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and look at the camera. All right, if you don't see yourself on the screen, then you're not, you're not on camera. Okay, we're going to look over here, Mr. Mr. John Conabare. Okay, so we're looking at the screen. We want to make sure that everybody out there knows how much we appreciate them being a part of the congregation at large. So we're going to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom, and we're going to tell them that we love them on three. One, two, three.